Support WrestleTalk! Give us a subscribe. Friday's episode of SmackDown ended with the big swerve. Following Adam Pearce signing the contract for his Royal Rumble Universal Championship match against Roman Reigns, the definitely not WWE general manager played up a knee injury, meaning he could no longer compete in that match. So in his place, Roman will have to face the man who nearly beat him at TLC, Kevin Owens. You might have missed some of that though, because Pierce's microphone kept cutting out during his promo. Kind of like he was going through an underground tunnel or something while trying to talk on the phone. WWE's production team frantically scrambled, switching his audio feed around, but Pierce's promo was sadly undermined by the production botch. Which, unsurprisingly, massively angered control freak Vince McMahon. Ringside News is reporting, so do take this with a pinch of salt, that McMahon and his head of production Kevin Dunn were livid backstage, being described as very pissed about it. Pierce's promo was the most important part of the show, and McMahon and Dunn apparently raged behind the scenes in an attempt to get it fixed. Because WWE is one weird company, they have in the past faked production errors to rib people, which is pro wrestling speak for a practical joke, they ripped people in the past dealing with it live in ring. But the report notes that this was 100% not a staged microphone malfunction. They did not want this to happen at all. A production f up to say the least. That's very rare around here in WWE. McMahon's control freak tendencies have been tested to the limit during the pandemic, which has seen WWE have to delay or drop numerous long-term plans, which they do when they're not in a pandemic, but this time it's not just because Vince decided he doesn't like Angel Gaza anymore. So to get ahead on the corona, not only has WWE's pay-per-view schedule for the next three months been potentially revealed, WWE themselves have also announced the next three years of WrestleManias. On Saturday, WWE officially announced that this year's WrestleMania 37 will take place at the Raymond James Stadium in Tampa Bay, the pirate-themed venue that was originally meant to hold last year's WrestleMania 36, before that was moved to the Performance Center, hopefully meaning we can finally get that big giant pirate ship set, and they have also announced it will again take place over two nights, Saturday the 10th and Sunday the 11th of April. This has been pushed back from the originally planned date of Sunday the 28th of March. Also according to the press release, WWE is hoping to have actual fans live in attendance for Mania 37, with them set to announce ticket information soon. This could be why the date was pushed back by two whole weeks. Hoping for the old normal back by 2022, WWE also announced WrestleMania 38 will take place on 3rd of April in Arlington at the AT&T Stadium, where they previously broke their kayfabe attendance record of 100 1,763 with WrestleMania 32, which is probably so they can boast about having the biggest live attendance in a post-coronavirus world. And then on April 2nd, 2023, WrestleMania 39 will take place at the SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles, which was originally booked for this year, with a Hollywood theme to be headlined by Roman Reigns vs. Rock the Dwayne Johnson. Rock will be 50 years old by that date, which is relatively spring chicken compared to some of WWE's usual top contenders, I'm sure he'll be fine to go. WWE's resolution for 2021, meanwhile, is to do all of the pay-per-views again. Now that we know the next three years of WrestleMania dates and locations, it's probably about time we knew what was happening in WWE over the next couple of months. And thankfully, PW Insider has internally confirmed the not yet publicly revealed Road to WrestleMania schedule. The Royal Rumble will take place on January 31st, then there will be an NXT TakeOver on February 14th. Please be St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Please be St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Elimination Chamber will take place the week after on February 21st. And AEW Revolution happens to be the week after that in a packed month of wrestling pay-per-views. And then it will be the return of absolutely no one's favorite pay-per-view, Fastlane, which will happen on the 21st of March. So Goldberg can presumably win the championship of your favorite full-time wrestler again. The two-night WrestleMania 37, of course, will then take place three weeks after that, starting on April. April 11th, but what about the Hall of Fame? Last year's class, which was set to induct the NWO, Batista, JBL, the Bella Twins, Jushin Thunder Liger, and the British Bulldog, never ended up happening. 
And now the Wrestling Observer is reporting current plans are to have the ceremony happening virtually with no fans in attendance. Which is probably a good idea to shield generally aged performers away from traveling and social distancing and all that sort of stuff during a pandemic. Because you wouldn't want to theme an entire episode of TV around that now, would you? It's presumed that the ceremony will induct the 2020 class rather than inducting any new inductees. But WWE isn't the only promotion holding pay-per-view events, as this past weekend saw Impact Wrestling's first big show of the year, the very newsworthy Hard to Kill. Almost every match had a larger wrestling business story attached to it. Fire and Flavor, made up of Kira Hogan and Tasha Steeles, won the tournament finals to crown the revived Impact Knockouts Tag Team Champions. Which is a great idea for a division that is so loaded with so much talent. Matt Cardona, the former Zack Ryder in WWE, made his surprise Impact debut, beating Ace Austin via DQ when Madman Fulton got involved. Fightful Select is reporting that Cardona will be working this week's Impact tapings, but doesn't have a full-time contract with the promotion. Cardona was last seen in AEW back in August after being released by WWE in April. While everyone kind of figured it out already, X Division Champion Manic was unmarked to reveal it's actually former WWE Cruiserweight Champion TJP. He retained the X Division Championship in a three-way match. Diona Perazzo made Taya Valkyrie tap to retain the Knockouts Championship and then called out wrestlers from any company, any challenger, everyone, further teasing AEW and Impact into brand matches. Eddie Edwards beat Sammy Callahan in a brutal barbed wire massacre match which definitely lived up to its name, with one side of the ring having a wall wrapped in barbed wire, and on the other side ropes wrapped in barbed wire. Then another has tables covered in barbed wire, and the last had weapons covered in barbed wire. Edwards won capping off their years-long feud that started when Sammy legit broke Eddie's face with a baseball bat. And the main event of the super elite of AEW champion Kenny Omega and Impact Tag Team Champions Doc Gallows and Carl Anderson beat Rich Swan, Chris Sabian and Moose, who was a last minute replacement for the injured Alex Shelley. Omega pinned Swan, presumably setting up an eventual AEW vs Impact Champion match. But those weren't the only big stories coming out of the show, as two people left the company. One on very good terms, the other, eh, not so much. During Hard to Kill's pre-show, Madison Rain announced that she will be retiring from Impact Wrestling. Not only was she a five-time, five-time, five-time Knockouts Champion and a two-time, two-time, two-time Knockouts Tag Team Champion, she's also been a creative force behind the scenes. And it is with a full and grateful heart that after 12 years, I announced my official retirement from Impact Wrestling. It is time for me, the wrestler Madison Rain, to go home and be a mum and move on with my life. Reign's announcement was met with praise across the wrestling business, with congratulations tweets from WWE, the Impact roster, and even former TNA president Dixie Carter. But for Ethan Page, who also finished up with the promotion on the same night, it wasn't quite on such good terms. 31-year-old Page, as part of the North with Josh Alexander, holds the record for the longest tag title reign in Impact Wrestling history. But he let his contract expired, reportedly looking for new challenges elsewhere, most likely in WWE or AEW. His final match for Impact was a comedy cinematic match of Page versus himself as his alter ego, The Karate Man, where Wikipedia officially records the result of victory via murder. The match was in that Tim and Eric vein of weird funny, entirely composed of Ethan fake fighting himself on different green screen backdrops. But according to Page himself, in a hard shoot post on the major wrestling figures Facebook group, it wasn't anything like he wanted. Last night, sucked. I'm so embarrassed with how Impact lazily edited that segment last night and forced it to be a joke. I felt the thought of the same guys fighting each other was comedy enough, and the more serious we took it, the better the reaction would be. But because I left the company, they lied to my face and just did what they wanted the whole time. I'm sorry if any of my fans paid for that pay-per-view felt cheated. I honestly feel the free version I gave away was made with more love, care, and attention to detail. Sadly, I had no control over the creative or the final product and the editor refused to send it to me beforehand. So I saw it live with you guys and I was surrounded by family, all scratching their heads at that high school project level delivery on a pay-per-view. 
I pray people know I didn't edit that hot garbage. I actually even begged Impact not to even have Karate Man on TV. I only wanted it to be on my YouTube channel. But we don't write the shows. We just get the scripts and do our best. What else to say? Breaks my heart this company refuses to respect its talent or its fan base on a regular basis. I was lied to, I was hurt, I was disrespected, and I need a break from it all. But according to Fightful Select, Paige wasn't the only one who'd had enough with the relationship. Apparently, Paige wanted his Karate Man character and match to be more like Matt Hardy's final deletion match. But Don Callis balked that he felt no matter how many times people tried, they won't top the original Broken Universe, thinking it worked more as a self-aware, goofy presentation. Don's fellow co-executive vice president Scott Demore, however, pretty much washed his hands of it. He was pretty angry with Paige as the original idea of Ethan's departure was for Josh to beat him and start Josh's establishment as a single guy. Would you like to know more about the history and context behind Roman Reigns' tribal chief character? Then click the explain video on the right where Laurie Blake details what makes it work and the fascinating Samoan cultural history behind the character. And what's going on with Randy Orton and the Royal Rumble? Click the other video below that. Subscribe to WrestleTalk for more daily video content. I've been Luke Owen. Jam that jam.